Hello, I'm Coach Patel and I'm joined by my co-host Jamie Bettridge. We would like to welcome you to the Football in Business podcast, where we will discuss all things football and business. On this podcast, we will delve into the minds of various individuals who have been involved in football and get an insight on the game that we'd all love to know. We will hear some brilliant stories and have some great laughs as we speak to individuals from the football world. Added to this, we will get an insightful view into the mind of someone who is a part of the game and understand how easy it is for them to transfer their core skills into business life whilst finding out about business ventures they are a part of. We've got some great guests lined up which can hopefully give us all a different view of the game and where life has taken them after the game. Please hit like, share and subscribe and if you know anyone who would be suitable for the show, please put them in touch. Welcome back to the Football and Business podcast. Today for our second episode, our guest is part of a very exclusive list of players who have scored last-minute winners at Anfield. It's none other than Brian Howard. Hi, Brian, how are you? Yep, I'm very well with self. Very good, thank you. Very good indeed. So let's crack straight on. So, so Brian, in 2003, um, you turned down a contract offer for, for, with Chelsea. Um, is that something you, you may regret now, obviously looking and seeing how the, the club's transformed? Uh, no, not at all. Um, I mean, I'd spent 10 years previous with um, with Southampton um, and kind of the reason I was leaving there was because the lack of first-team opportunities. Um, you know, and Chelsea at the time was um, a team that didn't really have the finances it does now. They were looking at young English talent. Um, I, I was in the England youth setup at the time uh, and they said that you're going to get a chance to play in kind of the cup games and, and train with the first team and um, you yeah, have a chance to progress and I went in for three months and I, I trained with the first team every day. I was training with the likes of Zola, Frank Lampard, Jock Terry, um, William Gallas, you know, proper, proper players and um, went away. You know, they were talking about uh, contracts, left it with the agent, you know, we were, uh, and I went away to the Toulon tournament with, with England under 20s. Uh, whilst I was out there for the two and a half weeks, um, Abramovich had bought the club. They'd signed Baron, Joe Cole, Hernan Crespo, um, yeah, there was no chance I was I was going to get any game time there. So it was uh, back to the drawing board really. And um, the agent at the time had just moved uh, Sam Parkin from Chelsea to Swindon, and they'd watched Sam in a couple of games, and I'd been involved in some games. So they were keen to get me and offered me a chance to go and play first team football. And obviously, it was still open to me down south, so it appealed to me. And what was that like? You know, Roman Abramovich coming in as you've just been offered a contract. Was there any part of you that wanted to maybe stay for the money? You know, the Alex Song story recently out in the press. Was was there anything about, you know, money that might have kept you at Chelsea or was that never a play in for? No, not really. I mean, the contract offers weren't uh, massive back then if you weren't in the first team um, compared, you know, from going in, going into a first team player at Swindon. You know, if I played every week, then you got paid appearance money and, yeah, there wouldn't have been a massive difference. You know, potentially, I could have progressed further at Chelsea and earned more money, but for me, it was about then to play football. Definitely. Then you moved to Swindon and, of course, uh, you made 70 appearances at Swindon Town. How did your time at Swindon shape you as a player, would you say? Just learned a lot. Um, you know, straight into a, a first-team environment with with senior pros, um, you know, the likes of Sammy Igo, Tommy Mooney, AD Vyavash that have all played at the top level, had promotions. Um, you know, they were coming to you know, the end of their career, sort of 30 plus. So it was just great to to learn off those. And, you know, it was a completely new experience and, and I loved it. Definitely. And then obviously the move then comes to Barnsley, probably where you're most well known for in your time in football. Um, I mean, one thing we want to touch on because on this podcast, we want to, you know, look at challenges footballers face. And it's the 06, 07 season when you were, when you avoided relegation by two positions in the table. At, at what point during the season do you realise we're, we're in the relegation scrap? Uh, from day one, really. I mean, that team, uh, it was a young team that got put together. Um, you know, I knew I was leaving Swindon. Um, they had financial difficulties uh, and I had lots of options. Um, I could have stayed down south at a few clubs, but just looked at Barnsley and felt it was a big club. And I know that they had a few other young lads there that I'd played in the England youth sat with. And they said, look, you know, we've got this young squad. We're going to, you know, play youthful exuberant football and just go for it. And uh, we want to get promoted. So we went there and we got promoted with, you know, I think the Steve McFail was one of the most experienced senior players at, at 26. 
um, other than the goalie Nick Colgan. So it was a really, really young squad. You know, it, it, everyone was sort of between 22 and 24. Um, so when we did get promoted, there was no real investment into the team. Um, there was no like, you know, new contracts. So, which is great because we all got given the chance. The gaffer stuck by us. Um, you know, everyone from day dot said, look, you've, you've got, there's no championship experience in this squad. Um, I think Steve McFell had actually left. So our most experienced player had left. Uh, he, he left on the free transfer to Cardiff. Um, so then, you know, our squad looking around it and it was very, very inexperienced for championship football. So everyone from, from day dot expect us to go down, which gave us an even bigger kind of underdogs feeling. And, you know, every game meant more to us. And to stay up was, was such an amazing achievement. Of course, so flipping that relegation battle, I guess from the start of the season, what you're saying is that the main aim was to stay up. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, it was. It's the it was the main aim to stay up and uh, you know build again. And yeah, what everyone was promised that if you do stay up, you'd get championship contracts and um, you'd be looked after. And uh, and we'd done that. And I think there was a lot of us that were, were suited to playing in the championship more than League One. Because obviously staying up by eight points, um, it wasn't really incredibly close by the end of it. Um, so going into those last few games of the season when, you know, Leeds, Luton and Southend were confirmed to go down, what was the feeling like around the dressing room in the club? Uh, relief. I think that maybe, that, maybe that season we got hammered last game of the season, 7-1 at West Brom, who got promoted that year. But that West Brom team was ridiculous. You had, you had Graham Dorans, um, Kevin Phillips. You know, like all top players in the champ, but I think they had Zoltan we went... Gira as well, didn't they? Yeah, That's yeah, right. Zoltan Gira, uh, Kamara as well. We played for Fulham as well. We used to do like the celebration with the thing on his on his ears. Um, it was a really special team. They had Jonathan Green in, you know, Paul Robinson, um, and uh, but we went into that game. We didn't care. We we we'd only trained once. We pretty much partied for a week. It was just a relief. <laughs> that, you know, our, our job was done. We were on holiday. Um, yeah, yeah, it's probably probably not good for the fans to hear that they travelled down and paid the money to watch on that last day. But I think they were having a party as well because yeah, you know, we wouldn't have been wanting to go to West Brom away on the last game of the season, so needing anything to stay up. So as soon as it was confirmed, it was you know we'd we'd completed our job and um, they start you know looking forward to next season. Great stuff. And then obviously another sort of challenge that um, sort of strikes out to me was uh, in 2008 for you, um, you, you know, you get the Scotland call up from George Burley, you know, you're looking for your first potential cap and then to have it taken away from you by FIFA. Was that something you were aware of or was that a bit of a surprise when FIFA intervened with that? Um, well, I knew Scotland were watching for a little while and um, I think on the Saturday it was the, the day we beat Chelsea in the FA Cup. Um, so we, we, that was on the Saturday and then the Tuesday night we were playing home to Ipswich. Um, I remember the gaffer pulled me just before, you know, you go in and do the team. So it was captain at the time and an hour before kickoff, you go in and do the teams with the referee and the opposing manager and opposing captain. He pulled me just before, which is, um, you know, unlike him. And uh, I was thought, oh no, what have I done wrong? was the first thought. Um, and he said, look, yeah, it's a letter from the Scottish FA. Um, you've been called into the squad to play Croatia and Czech Republic. Um, I was just like, wow, yeah, that's unbelievable. I'm, I'm, I'm buzzing. And I was like, Gaffer, I know like, you're not allowed your phones hour and a half before the game, but can I just text my dad? And he was like, yeah, look, no worries. And then get in the, in, in the, uh, in the manager's room. So then text dad, got Scotland call up. Uh, went out, played the game and we won 4-2. Um, thought I'd scored a hat trick and got one assist. I had one, one taken off me. So I you know, two goals and two assists. I just went out with this complete self-confidence that was unmatched and then yeah thinking for you know a week that i was going to get this call up and then um they come back and said that they've, they've put it through to you to change allegiances because you played for england but because i played in official competition so because i played in the under 16 and under 18 european championships which were official fifa competitions and i played in the under 20 world cup qualifiers which were official um uh, and the two long tournament then it meant that you couldn't change allegiances back then that they counted as caps if you know what i mean where now it's you've got to play a first team competitive game but then they count if, if i just played in friendlies i'd have been okay but because i played in official tournaments uh they wouldn't let me yeah. change so um yeah i mean it was, um, it was gutted and it's probably one of the biggest regrets kind of even though it's not really my in my hands but you know one of the lowest points of my career i look back if i could change one thing yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, for, for any footballer to get an international call-up is obviously probably the, one of the biggest moments in their career. So how long did that sort of take, you know, mentally to, to overcome that? And 
to get that playing back to your normal self? Um, I, I was okay, really. Luckily, at that time, again, we were we were still involved in you know probably another relegation scrap, and you know we had a, an FA Cup semi final to look forward to. So it's one of those you you know you pick yourself up, pull your socks up, and, and get on with it. Was there much help that you received from your club at the time with that in terms of support or chat about it, or was it something that you really just brushed off yourself and uh, cracked on playing football with Brian? Uh, I just done it myself, really. I was always very single minded from. You know, from a, from a young kid, from 10, 11 years old, I knew what, what I wanted to do. And, you know, no one was going to stop me. I wouldn't take no for an answer. Uh, and when I was always, I'm always one, even now, if, if I believe in something, I'll I'll stick to it. So, you know, it's one of those that I, I just wanted to prove everyone that, you know, that I was good enough to do it and and just keep going. It's probably a very pot, strong personality straight you, um, trait you have now as well. Nah, definitely. That's really interesting, Brian. We're going to move on to our quick fire round. Uh, so it's just a few questions. Um, one word answers of players or teams or uh, people you've played with in the past. All right, Brian? Yeah. Uh, cool. so, so if we start with the biggest joker you've ever played with. So biggest joker is probably Rob Kozluk, Um Played with him at Barnsley. Came from Sheffield United. Um, and I think uh, Neil Warnock in his book said that he would sign Cozzy at any club he uh, he went to just for banter in the dressing room because um, he he was that good. I mean, it was it was ruthless banter, and I don't know. He just had a knack of getting away with things that you probably shouldn't say, and everyone, you know, always uh, everyone had a turn of being the brunt of the joke, and he and he took it back as well. To be fair to him, um, but yeah, he just had a, had a real dry sense of humour, and um, yeah, no one could get away with anything around him. That's great to hear. Um, and the best player you've ever played with? Uh, do you know what? You know, lucky. So to play with Matt Letizia in in kind of um, yeah the reserves at Southampton when I was coming through, uh, I was lucky enough to like train with uh, you know Gianfranco Zola in the England youth setup. I was lucky enough to play with people like you know Jermaine Jennis, James Milner, Jermaine Pennant, um, some real top players. But I think probably the, the best player that I played with that I played with a, a lot that week in week out in the first team was probably um, probably Gilfie Sigurdsson. What yeah, a player! Class when he came through. Yeah. Makes it look easy, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Now we had some team at that time in the championship and yeah, you know, had him playing number ten and Shane Long up top. It was um it was a really good team. And the best player you ever played against? Uh well I mentioned the two long tournament before and our first game we, we, we played uh we played Portugal first game, sorry, and I think coloured boots had just started to come out and I had some white <laughs> boots. And it was, um, yeah, everyone was kind of like, you You better be a good player for wear white boots. And they had this kid wearing bright orange ones. Like <laughs> I can guess who that is, I think. Um, Charisma was in the squad. Yeah, and, and everyone said, this kid better be a player. And, uh, and it was Ronaldo. And, uh, yeah, I was going to come up <laughs> to the pitch and text my mate saying, mate, get on this kid Ronaldo, who plays for Port School Sport in Lisbon. Because he was, he was two, three years younger as well. Um, you know, we were under 20s, yeah. he was only 17. And it, I was like, this kid's going to be the best player in the world at some point. Just knew Back then, when you there. go to this tournament um, and you've got, you know, multiple great young players, how good was he compared to the rest? Was it easy to see? Yeah, yeah, he stood out. And, you know, it's one of those, I think you know when someone's a good player, when they're respected by all the rest of the players that you when you play against them. So, you know, you get on the bus and some people go, oh, someone was good. You know, no, I thought he was crap. I'm better than him, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then you got on the bus after that game uh, and we got beat 3-0. And uh, we said we had someone sent off first half early doors and it was 40 degrees heat, so it was tough. And um, <laughs> everyone come off and said, wow, you know, who's this kid? He was, he was unbelievable. And I remember the manager at the time saying, no, look, you lot need to look at yourself and worry about yourself rather than going on about him. He was just a show pony, blah, blah, blah. And then we watched the, the video on the debrief the next day and it was like, well, he scored one and got two assists. I think he's, he's not bad by him. <laughs> yeah, he's not a bad player at all, is he? Yeah. What about the worst trainer you've ever played with? Car worst trainer. Um, job. I hope he doesn't hear it because he's a manager now at a club and he might not sign any of my players. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, someone that uh, was had such an amazing career. Uh, I think uh, probably Darren Moore was wasn't the, the the best in training and keep balls and stuff like that. But he was uh, it was brilliant on match day. But he just on training and that he just you know sometimes didn't want to be in his father's side team. I'll make sure I'll email this podcast to him, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have you seen the size uh, of the row? Definitely don't. Yeah, I know. I've seen him a few times. I'm a, who's the most natural ability? The, the 
player you've played with, you just look at it and makes the game look so easy. Uh, probably Gilf mentioned there, Gilf Sigurdsson, just, you know, his touch, awareness, um, you know, the amount of goals that you see him scoring in the Premier League now, just like from 25 yards, but he's not he's not blasting it. The, the side footing him, he's curling it in. I remember we uh, we beat West Brom in the FA Cup uh, when they were a Premier League team. We were championship. And I, I managed to score a 90th minute equaliser, take us extra time, and then Gilf in extra time. I don't know how he'd done it. He just took it out of his feet, feet first time, put, whipped one top corner, the side footed so easy, about 30 yards straight in the top corner that put us into the quarterfinals. And, you know, he just does it week in, week out in the Premier now, just makes it look so easy. No, he is some player, isn't he? Uh, what about the biggest teacher's pet you've played with? Manager's best friend? <laughs> Son of the gaffer. Um, Oh, do you know what? That's a tough one. Uh, it definitely wasn't me because I seem to fall out with quite a few. Um, <laughs> about that, leave that one with me. I'll, I'll come back to you with that one. Uh, best manager you ever played under? Uh, Brendan Rogers. Um, he signed me for Reading um, and was just brilliant. Um, I just didn't get enough time with him. Um, you know, started the season and it was transitional for Reading to come down from the Premier League. Um, change of manager, change of system, change of kind of club dynamics, really, and going from a team that liked to play 4-4-2, get it wide and forward quick and in the box. So all of a sudden, Brendan come in and you see his philosophy now, what he's done at Swansea, what he's done at Liverpool, what he's now doing at Leicester. Obviously, Celtic's a bit different in Scotland, but he has that philosophy. He wants to play football in a certain way and he seems to do it at every club. And it was starting to get that way with Reading. Um, unfortunately, I broke my jaw, so was so was missing for a few months and and in that time, um, he lost his job because the results weren't reflecting our performances and, and they didn't give him the time. Um, so I was gutted that it was cut so short, but every day training, you'd, you'd, get, you'd get excited to go into training because you'd never do the same session twice. Everything was high intensity. Everything was with a purpose. You didn't just do a, a, a session for, for the sake of putting on a session. You'd done it with something that was going to be important to you playing at the weekend. So, um, yeah, fantastic coach. And you, know, you can see what he's done now at all these massive clubs and, you know, what he's done at Leicester again is you know, unbelievable. And I think even he's Li Liverpool wouldn't be where they are now with Klopp without what Brendan had put in underneath him. He, he built the foundations, really. Mm, he's putting together a right side at Leicester, aren't they? Slowly, uh, surely, you know, they're growing into a really strong side. Moving on then, the worst dancer. God, I'll probably put myself in that category, you know. Um, who else would have been bad with me? Um do you know what? I'm going to say Paul Reed because he's got a. Uh, I've heard him at Barnsley and Eastley, a great lad. Uh, he's now a Sunderland academy manager, uh, so you probably see him on Sunderland until I die. And uh, he's got a signature move um, that's uh, he kind of bends over and waves his hand about, and he thinks it's cool as, but it's uh, it's. Uh, I think more people are, are laughing at him rather than joining in with him. <laughs> Small case of dad dancing. Uh, very much so. But and I'm the not final one, so I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the final one the most memorable night out after a game one that I can actually remember um, no, probably <laughs> it's probably a couple when it, you, know, you go back to those Barnsley times and it was either after the Chelsea game um, or after the playoff win um, in 2006 um, the playoff win was incredible because it was, we had a bus all the way back to Barnsley from uh, from Cardiff. So it was a party on the bus, just got drops in the city centre in our tracksuits and medals and just went straight out and, and pretty much it was on the Saturday and then, you know, finished up bank holiday Monday night. It just was like three days straight um, celebration. And like I said, it was a young squad at the time and we, we, all, um, we, we all played hard and worked hard. But, so that was incredible. And then... Um, the Chelsea one because yeah, I had about thirty of my mates up from Southampton all came up and stayed in Barnsley for the weekend and again it was you know, we beat them and we all went out and you know, it's kind of like a scene from Entourage that every bar I went into. I had you know, thirty mates with me and, you know, kind of right just come in, have the table, don't pay for a drink, you know, and uh, you know, treated like an absolute hero. Are you the type to uh, you know, just sip on a pint or are you the one to sort of get ten Jaegers in and then just fill them in for everyone? Uh, a bit of both, I think. Depends. It depends on uh, what sort of night. Yeah, I don't mind sipping on a cold pint at times, but then uh, if it's time to party, we'll get the eggs in. 
<laughs> now moving on from that, uh, the cup run that you just mentioned there, the 0708 cup run, uh, making it to the semi final, and one memory that for, you know it sticks by me is the the winner at Anfield. Um, I just want to touch on that on the 16th of February 2008. Sort of as you as you rock up to Anfield, you're the underdogs going into the tie. Um, you're facing a tough league campaign. What, what's the thought going into the game? Um, nothing to lose. Really. Um, buzzing to you know, I think Anfield's one of those holy grail sort of a, as a youngster growing up, you're like always, yeah, I want to play at uh, Wembley, I want to play at Anfield, I want to play at Old Trafford. You know, they're kind of the the historic grounds. That, you know, especially my era growing up, they they were the places you want to go play football. So to be able to be captain and lead your team out at uh, at Anfield. It was like, wow, this is it's incredible. This is what all that hard graft and sacrifice as a teenager was for, to Definitely. get to these moments. You, that let's not waste it. And you hear on the TV, the presenters say, you know, the, the gaffer's probably saying it's free, free game. Go and have some fun. How true is that? What what what, what is the gaffer saying? No, he's like, look, don't. Yeah, you know, we've got a game plan. You know, you stick to it. You know, it's, it's a one-off game. Um, yeah, we've got to ride our luck at times because, I mean, other than Fernando Torres wasn't in the squad and then Gerard came off the bench, it was a full-strength Liverpool team um, that, you know, around that time of winning European Cups. Um, it was a, a fantastic team, fantastic squad. So, you know that you've got to ride your luck because they've got better quality throughout the team. But actually, it's a one-off game. So, just go out, give it all, leave nothing, you know, nothing out there and, and then let's see what happens. And if we can get in at half-time, it would be... Uh, when we're still in the game, we can we can give it a go second half. And well, we kept it down to one at half time, even though we were well up against it. And I think at half time we just thought, actually, we'll, we've got a chance here uh, if we can give it a go. And as soon as the equaliser went in, I thought, actually, we, we've we, we could win this. Could you almost sense that the team sort of lifting once you went one all, and sort of you know the, the whole team you know putting in more effort, and, and you realise you know what we could actually go on to win this. Yeah, and. All, and but also you feel from them you feel that deflation because they're like you know they're one nil up they're cruising you get to one nil they're like oh no like this could be a banana skin fuss this is going to be hard work we don't want that we're at home you know and could you, you sense get, the, you know, the, the could you sense the crowd getting on their back as well sort of at Anfield you know uh, no no the, the, the crowd were good they were good because they were creating chances they were they were playing well we just defended brilliantly and just hit, just played well on the break and you know we had a few chances ourselves. I think it was a really good game of football. And to be fair to their fans, quite a few of them stayed behind after and, and clapped us off the pitch, which I always respected. And something that, something that we spoke about before and it makes me, you know, re- really strikes me is Javi Alonso, what a player. Um, for someone like me, I love football. He plays football the right way. Yeah. When you drop that shoulder on him, and then mm-hmm. you, you struck the ball. What what went through your mind when, when you first, you know, hit the ball? Um, it... it it was a bit of a blur because you remember the goal Rooney scored a couple of years, well, a few years ago, and he was chasing the referee and then it fell to him and he hit the volley from about 30 yards in the top corner just out of anger. It yeah, was that's... the same. You know, I, felt like, you know, I should have had a penalty, so I've chased the referee and the ball's fell to me. And I was thinking, normally I'm in that position, I, you know, I'll drive at the, the fence and I'll pop it to the winger and get in the box. And I don't know, I just sort of thought, nah, I'm, I'm getting out of some anger out here. So, you yeah, managed to you know, skip past uh, Alonso and thinking, and then Carragher came to close me down and I drilled it past him and I knew I just caught it sweet um, and I was hoping that I caught the goalie off guard, um, which I did and um, I said, then the rest is kind of just a blur. And then you, then off you go and then full-time whistle goes. It's something that really got me. The first person you go up to at the full-time whistle is Javi Alonso to get his shirt. Yeah. Um, so you've just dropped a shoulder on him, and then you're going to go get his shirt. <laughs> I think, uh, I think after the goal, he was going to. Uh, I said to Stephen Gerrard, "Oh, any chance I could get your shirt?" Because uh, I, I never kept shirts. I don't have any memorabilia. It was all for my brother. And I was like, "Any chance to get your shirt?" And he's like, "I've already promised it to someone." And I was like, "Oh right." I thought, I thought, "Oh, the lad's already asking for shirts before the game finished." Like, that's a bit, bit strange. <laughs> um, when the final whistle went, I thought, "Oh no, who, who's got the?" Um, no, like, I need to get a shirt for my brother. So I said to him, I can have your shirt. And I think he was a bit annoyed the way the game went. And it got a bit funny. And then he, then he came out and said, oh, yeah, he's my shirt. So, you know, my brother's well, got What is the one. etiquette behind uh, getting a shirt off a, off a fellow pro? 
Um, normally, it's just after the game and you shake hands and say, oh, could you want to swap shirts with someone you respect? Or I, I was never really one for it. Um, you know, I always respected people I played against. And to be fair, I was lucky that quite, you know, quite a few people, I don't, a few referees and stuff, asked for my shirts throughout my career. So you always felt privileged when someone wanted that. Um, so, yeah, there's, that's probably the etiquette. I mean, you know, pulling more nowadays, it gets silly. People are swapping at half time and people have two or three shirts. But, but then you only had, you had four shirts for the season. And if you went past that, then you, you had to buy them yourself. You got 50 quid a pop, it'd get expensive if you're giving too many away. <laughs> yeah, you've got to keep hold of them. Um, just want to move on from there in your career to the CSKA Sophia move. Um, yeah, in- interesting and, times. So your whole career has been in England um, yeah. and then you sort of move out to Bulgaria. What, what was the what was yeah. the thought process there, Brian? Uh, try something different. I always fancied playing abroad. I so always looked at it and, you know, the offers I was getting to stay in England weren't, blowing me away. Um, I knew that I was kind of coming to the end of my career. And then, you know, an agent called me and said, look, there's going to be an English owner um, of this club or an English investor. Um, they want to make you and uh, Mama Sidibe from Stoke, you the marquee players. Um, you can get, they pay for your house, your car, your flights. You're going to get this money after tax um, and a chance to go and play in Europe. And I thought, you know, probably not going to get this opportunity again. And, you know, the, it, it was a good contract. I thought, you know, if, if I'm out there and they're paying for everything we live, if I save up the money, that's a good pension. Um, so I thought I'd give it a go. Um, went out there, really enjoyed the start of it. You know, something new, beautiful city, good club. Um, and then all of a sudden, started to not be paid. Um, and then people were knocking my door, the rent hadn't been paid. Uh, and the club were in financial difficulties. So... Um, you know, I'd, I'd a, another six months with a year option uh, to stay out there. But come January, I was like, yeah, I just need to get back to England. Um, things weren't going great out there. Um, and luckily, I had the opportunity to sign for Birmingham. So um, I had to do a deal with a club that I gave up so much of my money to get my registration released because they threatened to keep it for, for a longer amount of time. And um, yeah, took a deal, took a payoff and, and come back to England. <clears throat> So when, so when you come back to England, um, like you said, you, you know, you first come back to, to Birmingham and then obviously you went to, to Oxford and Eastleigh um, and sort of worked your way down the leagues. Um, was that just for the love of the game or, you know, because a lot of players, you know, they sort of start when they start going down the leagues, they then decide, you know, that's it. and They, they don't want to play anymore sort of thing, I suppose, may, maybe once the money's gone out. Yeah, uh, fair. So I played at Birmingham. It was, it was back in the championship. So. I wanted to play back in the champ and, and done okay, scored early doors and then I broke my toes. Um, so I was out for a bit, came back, played in a under 23s game um, to get some fitness and um, a couple of the players got injured so they come off so I had to play the full game. I was only going to play 60, 70 minutes and the game was a cup game so it went to extra time and one of their players took, because they were, they were part-time, uh, who were playing against, took a heavy touch, I nicked the ball and he went through me and then done my ankle and that was me season done. Um, and then Birmingham had the financial issues and stuff and, you know, there wasn't a contract there for me. So it was where I was going to go. I nearly went back to Barnsley, but you know, decided I didn't want to move back up north at that stage of my career. I had my house down south. Um, so kind of drew an, an hour radius of where I could travel to. Uh, and Oxford popped up and Michael Appleton was manager who had signed me at Portsmouth previously. He said that I'd love to have you in the building. Uh, and went there and, you know, I've never played in League Two before. And yeah, actually so it was, it kind of, I lost my love for the game. I just didn't enjoy it. Um, and then I knew there was an opportunity to play for Eastley. Eastley were having a go at it at the time. And I thought, you know, I'm an Eastley boy. If I can come here and get them promoted to the to the league for the first time in, in the history, it would be a great little fairy tale to finish on. And unfortunately, we lost in the playoffs. Um, but I just knew once we lost in the playoffs, I remember sitting there after the game and was like, that's me done. Um, you know, even though I was, it was a 33, I was like, no, nah, I, I, I don't want to do it anymore. I want to go and do something else. And, you know, I should, I should always speak about this in a minute, but I'd already kind of got my fingers uh, involved in a bit of agency work. And I seemed to enjoy more of that than, than I did playing. Let's go straight into that. Then. So, you know, moving on to your life now, after your playing career, uh, you've gone into sports management. The firm's called Momentum. Um, when did that really start um, building traction, Brian? So, yeah, when, when I decided to leave Oxford, I knew that that was pretty much me done 
full time football. So Eastley was training three days a week, three mornings a week, and uh, so Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, play on the Saturday. Um, so that enabled me to have some more time. So I started to do research into. I was always keen. I was always wanting to get be involved in my contracts. I was always asking questions. Um, I was always trying to advise younger players on their contracts when I was captain of a football club or a senior player. So it was just always something that intrigued me. Um, and it just gave me a bit more time to, to look into that. And, you know, my then agent at the time was, he had an idea of putting this group, to, he called it Cassius, and um, he was into boxing. But he had a group of young players. And, he, and he, his idea was rather than looking after a load of senior players and getting involved, have a group of young players, but develop them physically, mentally, and add another side to it. And I loved it. And, um, you know, in that group of players, they were all kids at the time, but you had Josh Brown, who has just moved to Burnley in the last window. You had Sam McQueen, who's played the Saints in the first team. You had Callum Chambers, who then moved to Arsenal. You had Joe Lumley, who's now the goalkeeper, number one goalkeeper at uh, QPR. You got Morgan Fox, who then moved from Charlton to Sheffield Wednesday for over a million quid. Um, you know, that's just five. There was about 10 players that are all now doing really well in their career. Um, but then he had an issue with Callum Chambers and he Callum Chambers left the company and um, he kind of fell out of love with the agency. So I was then working there. He pop, put all the players up with another agency where then I went to work for. Um, and I met my now business partner working there and, and we just had our own ideas. We got on great. Um, we were there probably for about 18 months and, you know, the guys of the other company had different ideas of what we wanted to do. So we took all our players set up momentum two two years ago and um you know we've just gone from strength to strength. No, that's brilliant to hear. And I mean, with the industry, we hear a lot in the press about the super agent. They really tarnish uh an agent's name. Um what are the ethics of momentum and what do you do differently for, for local British players? We do what's best for the player. Um you know we're very, very honest, uh, always up front about any fees that we would earn. We would always, even if we knew that we could earn a bigger fee moving a player from one club to another, but that wasn't the right move for him, we would make sure that the player comes first. Even yeah, you know, yeah, we we would still make our money. And I say to all my younger players now and all our players, you just concentrate on the football, um, and and the money will come to you. So we we're the same as an agency. We concentrate on our players, uh, and and we'll be successful in, in the business world. We could buy doing all the right things, you know, rather than just trying to make an extra few quid. I think if you concentrate on just solely making money, you come up short. I think that's in life and as well. But and if you do a good job by people and you stand by people and you look after them, then, you know, you make sure that you, you have a successful business and that's what we've done. And, we, you know, we like to have our integrity and, um, you know, some players we've not looked after because we felt it would, uh, wouldn't be right for our company. Um, and and we, we like to look after good players. If I'm phoning a club or a manager, he knows that my player is a good lad um, as well as a good player. And I think that's very important. And isn't it great when you speak to your new players, um, you can tell them about your story when you left Chelsea to go to Swindon. Um, so, you know, you walk it and you talk it. Yeah, no, it's it's great. And so we had a, a Zoom meeting the other night and we, we've um, got a, a mind coach now with us. And it, we were talking with him before lockdown, but I think it's even more important now that, because there's so much uncertainty at the moment in the world and in football that the lads can talk and you know we offered it to everyone some lads are good some aren't but we think we had about 20 lads on a zoom chat the other night and you know just offered something different and it was great to talk about those experiences and i talked about you know the way i've felt in my career and it's you know some of them are at their, their stages now so um yeah it's great that i can be able to offer that you know life experience that i've had do you think sort of during your playing career that um, there was enough advice uh, and enough help to, to help young players or, or is that sort of like a driving force that, that helped you set this up? Uh, yeah, probably not. You know, the, an agent shop back then was to do a contract and, you know, that that was about it. Um, Speaking now and then, but I think it's very much full on now. Um, players want advice, players want a lot of attention, players want to know what's going on. So, um you know, it's not just us doing it. A lot of the agency world has changed. Obviously, you, you hear certain stuff about some the press want to uh, talk about. But, you know, there, there are some really good agents out there, um, not just us. And, and they look after their players really well. Of course, in same as all industries, there's some some ones that aren't great. They're just all about their, the money and all about themselves. Um, but, you know, I think the, the, a main majority now are, 
uh, are doing well. It'll be interesting how, how it all comes on, you know, after the coronavirus, because I think some agencies might go under because, you know, of, of contracts might lose some players. Um, so it'll be very, very interesting how it plays out. Yeah, I mean, there's um, indications that League Two might be cancelled. Um, do you think other leagues should follow suit? Uh, and how are your players coping through this uncertain time? Yeah, I think League Two is done now. Um, League One will be cancelled. It'll just be a vote of how to finish it. Um, championship, they want to play it out. I don't, you know, they've obviously got the money to do the testing and the safeguarding. Um, will it get done though? I'm not sure. Uh, and you know, with the Premier League, the, the boys are back training today, well, from yesterday. So, I think that will get done. It will just be in the time frame. And but the big issue is going to be contracts. You know, a lot of players. Um, contracts finish uh, on the 30th of June so they can't you know players uh, clubs won't have the same teams they won't have the same squads come 1st of July if they're asked to play in July it'd be very very difficult to get strong teams out because players won't be playing and then some players won't be getting contracts Do you think they're going to offer some sort of extension for these players or? Well this is it it's, we're saying uh, well on, on the legal side of saying you can't just offer if you've got 10 boys out of contract and you can't wait to get rid of three of them because they're on high wages. You can't get rid of them and then just offer three contracts to the boys that you want to keep. It's either one, you know, all for one or nothing at all. So, um, because, you know, if that happens, then the boys that are out of contract won't be able to sign for another club. So you're stopping someone going to work. So, you know, English employment law, you can't stop someone working. So, you know, that the transfer window is the 1st of July. Um, some people have already got contracts at other clubs on that day, some pre-contract. So um, it's going to be an absolute minefield of legalities and whatever they decide on, whatever clubs um, fall on the, the harder side of it, you know, with promotions or relegations, you know, they're going to um, be in court and there's going to be some real strong legal battles. And you know, I've even seen stuff today about they're going to relax some of the financial fair play problems this year and, um, that will relegate some other teams other than others and they say, well, that's against the rules. Um, so it's, it's, it's a real, real mess out there. And I said, just, you just want the governing bodies of the sport to go, right, these are the rules, black and white, like it or lump it and get on with it. And then at least everyone can, you know, get their head around it and, and move on. Is it a good chance for momentum to grow as we come out of the coronavirus? It's, yeah, it's a good opportunity for us. Um, you know, luckily we're a, um, you know, we're, we're independent, you know, boutique company really that you know we've got you know 40 odd players but we don't have any overheads you know we don't have to run an office you know our cars are our office we work from home um, because we like to get around and be hands-on and see everyone rather than sitting in an office all day we call them armchair agents so I think we've got a good opportunity that we're we're in a good spot for the next year or so um, you know we've we've got deals that are going on this summer we've got 12 boys out of contract um, you know, this you know we're, we're in talks with a few other players and a few other clubs. So, you know, I think we're going to be in a good place, and we'll be really busy once we're able to to get some deals done. I mean, I've I've been on the phone quite a bit the last couple of days. Things are starting to move because you're getting closer and closer to July. So yeah, so um, you know, I'm saying I think I think there'll be um, a good opportunity for us once once we come out of this and know you know, the, what the rules are going to be, black and white. So how do you find um, players to join your management firm? Do, do players come to you or do you reach out to them? Uh, obviously, at the start, we, we had a group um, that we, we, we took over to Momentum and then you kind of scout players, you look at them, um, you try to speak to them and find out the situation, if they have agents, if they're happy. And then, you know, luckily, over the last couple of years, we've built up a good reputation that now we get recommended to people and, you know, some of our other players are really good that say, look, we're, I'm in a dressing room and so-and-so is leaving their agent, they don't like him. Um, or they're friends of another player that's leaving their agent or doesn't have an agent. Um, or even, you know, some some people involved in football have said, look, you know, I've had someone come to me and recommend an agent and I've recommended you. So, you know, can you speak to them? So that's kind of how we do it. A um, bit of both, really. We get some recommendations um, and then we, you know, we go and chase some players as well. So it's, um, it's quite a good way to do it. And what, what key lessons did you learn throughout your football career, which you can now put into your journey at Momentum as you almost start, you start to rebuild yourself again, but in a different industry? Yeah, just the same single-mindedness. Um, you know, when you believe in something, you don't give up hard work, you know, 
hard work's the one you've got to put in the hours. I mean, the miles that I've done over the first 18 months or even the, the, the full two years of momentum on, on the car and the hours that I put in, the late nights after games, coming back from up north in the Midlands, getting in at, you know, silly o'clock because they shut the A34, but then up the next morning and into London for another meeting to meet other players or off to another game. You've really got to put the effort in. Um, and I think once the players see the effort you're putting in, they um, they respect it. And that's when you, you kind of, you know, build your company and your reputation. Definitely. And then the final question for you today, Brian, moving forward, what does the future look like for Mo- Momentum? Well, if you asked me this pre-COVID-19, um, very bright. You know, we, we were looking forward to a really, really good summer. Lots going on. Um, but... Now it's it's like I said until we get answers from the from the FA, the Football League, the FL, uh, the PFA, it's um it's still going to be um yeah a little bit cautious of stuff, but I think we're still going to have a really bright future. Um and I think yeah the way we work and the way we want to work will come out of this stronger than a lot of others will, and I'm sure that you know me and my business partner we have the same determination, the same work ethic, the same beliefs that you know we'll kick on and and do really well. We're looking forward to following the journey that Momentum go under. Um, and really thank you for coming on the podcast today, Brian. Thank you very much, mate. No, cheers, yes, guys. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Cheers, buddy. Thank you very much for listening to this podcast. This is brought to you by Your Lead Machine and Deepest. We look forward to you joining us for our next episode. If you have any questions for us or things you'd like to know about the afterlife of a footballer, please let us know by dropping us a message on Instagram. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit like, share and subscribe. And if there's a guest you'd like us to get on the show, please let us know.